Welcome back, everybody. Oh, yeah, okay, there. Yeah. That rehearsal paid off. <laughs> Our next presenter is Dr. Rudy Shield. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Rudy, especially those of you that don't know him, some stuff that's not in the program guide. Rudy is a career astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Okay? Guys, this is the largest center for astrophysical research in the world. Okay? Rudy doesn't have any books or videos to offer you at the end of this presentation. Now, the reason is that all of his work is published in the peer-reviewed journals, okay? We have hard science taking the DS right here. Now, all of this being said, okay, Rudy is not up here. He is one of us, okay? I promise you this. You can, you can buy him a drink and talk to him about anything, and he is open and he is down to earth, and he will give you the best of himself that he can. Now, how do I really know that he's one of us? Here's a little secret. Just about every year in the fall, Rudy and I get together, and we're usually in the hot tub, and he bends spoons. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rudy Shields. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming. After some of yesterday's talk about the mic on, is the mic on? Okay, you can't hear me. So, and let's get the echo out of here. Done. After yesterday morning's talk and remarks about academic imperialism, I'm not so sure I really want to stand before you as a representative of some glorious institutions which have done their fair share. However, I do anyway because, you know, we are coming to the most amazing places in astronomical research right now that very much impact what we're coming to learn from you, the people who would not be told that, oh, you didn't see that, oh, you imagined that. Now I see all of this coming together. I think all of you who have been in this subject have encountered the problem of what I might call intellectual creep. And that means that if you've had a UFO experience, chances are you're interested in crop circles. Or uh, if I could have the slide, please. Um, um, have, uh, have encountered mysteries relating to crop circles, telepathy, psychic experiences, abductions, all these kinds of things seem to have happened to the people who have UFO experience. And I have been interested in these for some time. I call them the modern miracles, where of course miracles are the things that we can't explain by the paradigms of our civilization. And I think you know how our civilization has dealt with all of these modern miracles. We've said, oh, it's just those UFO weirdos. It's just those life after death people. Send them back to the near death experience hotel. It's just the telepathy crowd. It's just the cattle mutilation crowd. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just. Send it all off to the National Enquirer. And now, what I want to tell you is that in the quantum universe that we're now beginning to see in astronomical observations, it turns out it's all the same thing, or 
we understand it all in one stroke of the pen. It's an amazing time in the history of our civilization. And you've heard that before, of course, and I'm sorry if it sounds tired. Now, I come to this because of my interest in black holes. And um, a great deal has been written about black holes. You can't follow any science literature today without hearing about Stephen Hawkins and Leonard Susskind trashing each other about the nature of information transfer into the black hole and so on. And there's, of course, the standing battle among the theoreticians about who's the greatest among the greats. Well, guess what? They're both wrong. The arguments that you hear advanced now are getting so excessively esoteric, nobody is really following all of that stuff, and for a very good reason. The object that nature makes is not the technical black hole which causes them so much difficulty. From astronomical observations, which I and some students and colleagues have made, we see that what nature in fact makes is a magnetic variant of the black hole. This object is called a MECO. And I want to discuss with you, oh, by the way, MECO means magnetic eternally collapsing objects. And the fundamental idea is the same, namely that nature comes together with some gas clouds, and in, if there's enough of the gas in it, the thing can collapse and collapse and collapse without limit. That was the old paradigm. What we're finding from observations is that the thing acts more like an object which has a strong magnetic field in it, and that magnetic field and quantum electrodynamics prevent the formation of that event horizon, and instead you get an object which we technically call an eternally collapsing object. Now, the Miko isn't the only thing I'm going to pull out of the magician's hat today. I also want to talk to you about some very important developments in astronomy. One is the development and understanding of dark energy. <coughs> You've heard it described in Scientific American in the context of Einstein's greatest blunder, except it wasn't such at all. It turns out that he was right and that with astronomical observations of the universe, in particular observations of the brightnesses of supernova over historical aeons of time, we've come to understand that in fact we are now entering a period of re-inflation or re-expansion of the universe, which seems to indicate that there is an important negative gravity at work in the universe increasingly today. This has a great number of names. It's called Einstein's greatest blunder. It's called quintessence. It's called ether. It's called the dark energy. It's called orgone energy. You still hear me? All right, we're having technical, and no, I think we're up again. Thank you. It's called all of these things, but it's the thing that we discovered in observations, and I think for the rest of this talk, I will try to call it the dark energy that I displayed here. And um, I want to remind you that those of you who read Kip Thorne's book in the mid-90s, I think 1993, 94, that book, Einstein's Outrageous Legacy, Black Holes, Wormholes, Warps of Space and Time, in that book, he makes the observation, I believe it's chapter 14, that if the universe has a field, contains a field, which has the property of negative gravity, then wormholes will be enabled. And guess what? In the last 10 years, we have discovered this field, and we've called it dark energy. <laughs> 